Anything else you want? Oh. Okay. When two women claim to be the mother of the same child, King Solomon made a judgment to cut the baby in half and resolve the dilemma. And it was resolved when the real mother chose to give up her share to save the baby's life. Well, I'm no Solomon, <laughs> but I am stuck here <laughs> between the diametrically opposed viewpoints of Judy Mikovits and John Coffin, both of whose science I greatly respect. And I don't truthfully know who to cut or what to cut. Uh, except uh, that I'd like to cut out of here. <laughs> so I, I think I'll just first try to review their two presentations and then see where we, where we go from there. So Dr. Mikovits uh, told us that she has detected gag and arm sequences of XMRV and more recently also PMLVs in a high proportion of patients uh, with this syndrome, uh, and a dramatically lower p number in healthy controls. In the original <laughs> publication, 67% versus 3.7%. She's also detected antibody in the majority of patients uh, who have these viral sequences. Uh, she has detected XMRV in serial samples from the same patient over time. Uh, she has cultured XMRV from PBMCs and even better from <laughs> plasma of patients who are PCR positive for either gag uh, and or envelope using these uh, LENCAP uh, prostate cancer cell lines. She has found no evidence for contamination of the LENCAP cell line or of the reagents that she's utilized in her lab. Uh, she's tested innumerable healthy controls and assay controls uh, they've always tested negative. They've tested, she's tested negative controls to be negative in, in coded panels. Uh, and she claims never to have had the 22RV1 cell line uh, in her laboratory, uh, the one that Dr. Coffin uh, found to be contaminated. So Dr. Mikovits concludes that mouse leukemia-related gamma retroviruses can infect humans and are strongly associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. And it sounds quite plausible. Uh, and this is just one data slide from her to show the uh, link, the uh, coexistence of the virus and the antibodies in most of the patients tested, although some have one or the other. So if you just saw that, you'd, you'd be uh, relatively content. But Dr. Coffin, uh, presents this data from Oaks, where whenever XMRV uh, gag sequences are found, they also found evidence for mouse mitochondrial DNA by uh, those assays, or he, he prefers the IAP assay. Uh, not only that, many samples that tested negative also had mouse genomic sequences. Uh, and they concluded that the positives are due to sporadic contamination <coughs> with mouse DNA. Uh, Dr. Coffin then went on to show that exogenous murine leukemia viruses uh, endogenized in, in mice, uh, but at some point uh, the receptors changed and these endogenous viruses became uh, unable to infect mice, but now were xenotropic. Uh, and then could infect other uh, species, including man. Uh, but the key in his analysis here is that in the original prostate cancer studies, the, uh, uh, they took prostate cancer tissue um, and uh, took it from the tumor and passaged it in uh, nude mice. Uh, uh, grafted into news mice and then again and again and his postulate is that as it was passaged in the nude mice that uh, xenotropic viruses in the mouse then contaminated the prostate cancer cell line 
uh, and that this happened over time, so that early on in these passes there was very little evidence for XMRV, but over time uh, it became stronger and stronger, and that this particular uh, 22RV1, which has sort of been widely used, uh, is contaminated with a virus that was actually generated uh, in these uh, in these mice, and that this came after the recognition of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, he further shows that uh, XMRV might be a, uh, a hybrid or recombinant of two pre-XMRV viruses, one of which is replication competent, the other which is not, and that if you put these two together, it almost perfectly matches XMRV. So Dr. Coffin's uh, conclusions is that mouse mitochondrial DNA and or these intracisternal A particles are found in many samples that text, test XMRV positive, as well as in those that test negative. That XMRV evolved from XMRV negative prostate cancer xenografts that were passed in these dude mice and then became infected over time. That XMRV is a recombinant of two pre-XMRV strains only one of which is replication competent. And an XMRV was created in the lab long after MECFS was recognized as a clinical entity. And an XMRV is a contaminant that does not warrant further study. Uh, that, I think, is a sort of a quote. Uh, so where do we go with these two very, very uh, divergent pieces of data? I do want to give you this cautionary note, the fact that contamination can occur, and nobody doubts that, does not mean that it has occurred in any given laboratory. And there's <laughs> yet no direct evidence for contamination in either the Mikovits lab or the Lowe laboratory. So <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, I think rather than cutting the baby in half, the resolution may come uh, first of all, we have to resolve this issue. Uh, is this contaminant or is it real? Uh, and I think it will be addressed by two coded panels that are currently in preparation. There's a National Heart and Lung Blood Institute panel which employed samples that have already been found to be XMRV positive. Uh, and we'll, we'll distribute these under code uh, with multiple controls uh, to five laboratories, including WPI, which has actually supplied a lot of these samples, but won't know when their own sample is coming back. The second panel is uh, done by NIAID. It's uh, getting the name of the Lipkin panel. Dr. Lipkin's in Columbia, and he's coordinating this whole very massive uh, uh, process. Uh, here, they're going to collect samples from uh, five or six different uh, centers of CFS excellence, picking out the most classic cases of chronic fatigue so that people can't argue at the end that this, this was poor selection. Uh, they will draw large volumes of blood. Uh, these patients have never previously been tested for XMRV, so there's no, no uh, selection bias. Uh, they will then be sent to Columbia, uh, coded, uh, separated, and coded, uh, coded in triplicate uh, with match controls, and then sent to <coughs> WPI, to the FDA lab of Dr. Lowe, and to the CDC. If the controls test positive, then contamination will have been proved and the case will be closed. Uh, Coffin will have won this argument. If the controls are negative uh, and the majority of patient samples test, test positive for XMRV or PMLV, then the association with CFS will have been confirmed in a blinded way. Uh, but even if the association is confirmed, causality will not have been proved. So I think that's where we stand. These panels are going to come uh, this late this spring, or early summer. They're going to take quite a while to do because they're so complex. Uh, but hopefully we'll have some answers this year. Uh, so I just want to leave you. I'm somebody who in uh, an hour and a quarter will maybe out of work. Uh, <laughs> and and I, just, I, just want to, I just want to tell you something about government workers. Uh, we get a bad rap. Uh, we're, we're, we're considered to be quite lazy, and uh, we don't work anyway is kind of the feeling. Uh, 
But I want to tell you that I always give 100% at work. It, it's, just, it's just that it has a, a peculiar distribution. <laughs> so, uh, so today is Friday. I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Judy, do you, anybody want to come here? Yeah. I, I would like to say something. Um, I, I would like to say that what I've seen here this, this week says that clearly, you know, XMRV at best, what we originally set out to do five years ago was a systems biology approach. We used those genomic technologies with Mike <coughs> Dean and Mary Carrington. We used a microarray from the NCI. Uh, to, to screen all the pathogens. And what we saw was what we heard from Mary Schweitzer, that a lot of um, active pathogens and things like shingles, things like enteroviruses, things like EBV, CMV, HHV6, they're all totally on in that microarray. Um, in NCI's infinite wisdom, it didn't put XMRV on it. So <laughs> that's how we ended up going back. But we didn't look with a hypothesis for retroviruses. We took the systems biology approach, collected samples from <laughs> well-defined patients who had the infectious characteristics that Tony Komaroff talked about and that were in the low study that Dan Peterson had done. Oh, these patients had data on them for decades. We took samples over three years. So it wasn't that we found the virus in every sample indicate, like the macaque study, where it quickly went into the tissues, like the mouse study that came up this week that said the, vir the antibody responses were weak and transient. We don't know everything about this virus, but HIV does not cause AIDS. The CDC definition is HIV and one of 25 copathogens. So the Lyme, the EBV, the uh, enteroviruses, Martin Lerner's patients who don't get better with the alcite. This is a reasonable hypothesis because we see the same thing. We've developed a cytokine signature that is distinct from Nancy's cytokine signature and from Ben Nadelson's. So this is a, a marker to follow on clinical trial improvement. But there's no doubt these people are infected. With HTLV1, HTLV1 if you're seropositive and you're sick, you can get some kind of treatment. I'm not saying antiretrovirals, I'm saying immune modulators. So the patients that are found to be infected now, and there are thousands of them, need, need something now, not three years from now when Lipkin decides there's an association. Whatever their disease is, they're infected and sick. And I know John has patients that are, or Chia has patients who are co-infected and they don't treat the same way. So we can get together with the physicians who have co-infected patients, even Lyme doctors we're working with across the country, and start doing something now. Take it out of CFS. It's not about CFS. It's, it's, it's about a retrovirus we don't understand very well. As Frank Rossetti <laughs> said at a meeting a month or so ago, if this were HIV, it would be 1983. That's all. Judy, I think you need to be careful. You said when Lipkin decides whether or not XMRV I, I is know. real. I know. I'm just saying just when the Lipkin study, that. I'm not saying anything. Lipkin's a wonderful man. I'm saying when the Lipkin study is done, two years from now. The way it's set up, there's 1,300 samples, and I've got to do what I do, and it takes two months on every one of them. Oh, yeah, great. Just uh, a word. Uh, as a neurologist who, again, believes uh, this ailment uh, has, is the brain, uh, uh, the brain is the organ being affected, we looked at our spinal fluids using both a broad uh, a viral panel and the specific look at XMRV. A paper just came out a few days ago, and we found nothing, unfortunately. But, but so, the uh, damage at a distance, the microglia, Sandy Rossetti's entire work, the infected cell doesn't have to be the may, brain. Obviously, well, and we don't I mean, know anything about the stability not, in It CSS. obviously may not see. I mean, obviously, there are examples of CNS infection that don't go to spinal fluid. And uh, but with HIV, it does. But certainly, it's negative. So it, you know, it doesn't tell us there. We, hopefully, there are other explanations. I'm just reporting the data. Yeah, two samples. Thank you. It was not a good study. Thank you. We'll go late. <laughs> yeah, right. It's totally flawed. John, uh, John Kuziak uh, in the neurology. I have to just say, I'm always doing it wrong. So. There's, there's no validation of, 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 of looking at CSF in spinal fluid. There's no validation. It's a different sample matrix. It's not blood. So you... Okay. Neurology. It's biology.
So I'm uh, here to report on the neurology uh, session. It was uh, considerably less controversial than <laughs> the previous one. And uh, I, I'd just like to very briefly summarize the uh, discussion that occurred and perhaps take uh, an